Elliot Colburn. Elliot Colburn to move the motion. Under your chairmanship, and I beg to move that this House is considered e petition 331453, entitled Scrap Removal of Free Transport for Under 18s from TfL Bailout. Uh, and can I thank all honourable and right honourable members for turning up to take part in this uh, debate today? I can see that there's quite a lot of us on the call list, so uh, in order to fit everyone in, I will try to speak as quickly as I can, and I hope members will forgive me if I don't take any intervention, so hopefully everyone can get in. Uh, in uh, moving the petition, I'd like to thank on behalf of the Petitions Committee the over 170,000 people who have signed this petition, including 1,272 people from Carshalton and Wallington. Now, I appreciate there might be questions as to why we're having this discussion, given that the second bailout of TfL did indeed protect free transport for under-18s, but I think we know that this is a live issue which will likely come back, so I think it's only right that we take the time to discuss it this afternoon. Now, I might be showing my age here today, David, but I'm from a generation who can remember the introduction of the Oyster Card Scheme and free travel for under-18s, uh, from the days of keeping loose change by the front door uh, to get the bus to school, uh, to changing over to the Oyster Card system when I was in high school. Uh, so I have some personal experience of uh, the impact that um, removing free transport for under-18s could have, having been on both sides uh, of the introduction. Therefore, I do want to pay, pay particular tribute to the team at the Petitions Committee who have been conducting a survey amongst those who have signed our petition and to find out a bit more about their views. And to date, we've had over 3,000 responses to that survey. And if members will permit me, I'd just like to run through some of the key findings um, that the survey showed us. Participants were asked how important zip cards or other forms of concessionary travel were for young people and the impact that the removal might have. A zip card or other form of concessionary travel was reported to be very important to access school or college by 93% of respondents. It was also considered to be very important by 80% of people for accessing services including medical appointments, 79% for work, 72% for training, 60% for accessing leisure and extracurricular activities, 65% for socialising and 62% for meeting family and friends. If the 16 plus zip card scheme was suspended, 71% of respondents said that they would find it extremely difficult to access school or college. 57% said it would make it extremely difficult to access work. 61% said it would make it extremely difficult to access services, including medical appointments. The survey went on to ask the respondents what impact the removal would have on their travel habits. Almost five times as many young people said that they would use taxis very frequently, with the number of people who would use a private car um, frequently or very frequently more than doubling. The number of respondents who indicated that they would cycle increased by 82%, but there was no significant change indicated on those who said that they would walk. The survey also found that 60% said that they would use the Tube, GLR, and London Overground and TfL Rail less, and 56% said that they would use a bus or a tram less. So it is clear that petitioners feel that this would have a great impact on their lives. Therefore, I think it's only right that we look at the very heart of TfL's financial situation. And it would be easy, I think, to say that coronavirus and the subsequent drop in passenger numbers is responsible for TfL's financial woes. Uh, indeed, the onset of COVID-19 uh, has resulted in significant reductions in passenger demand, not just in London, but across the country. For most of March and April, daily tube use was around only 5% of normal levels, and daily bus use was only 18% of normal levels. Now, whilst we have seen a rise in passenger numbers over the past few months, they've remained stubbornly far below normal pre-pandemic levels, and the recent reimposition of an England-wide lockdown has also had its effect on, on, finance, on TfL's finances. However, I want to go on to talk about the state that TfL's finances were in before the pandemic hit. Because it, because it is clear to me that Londoners were and are being let down by a mayor whose mismanagement of the capital's transport network has cost TfL billions of pounds in lost revenue, waste and bailouts, as well as the pursuit of transport policies that the mayor knew that TfL could not afford. And there are countless examples of this, if I could just run through a few. At least £640 million in revenue by freezing pay-as-you-go fares, which essentially benefit tourists, but not Londoners who saw the cost of their travel cards rise. Crossrail has been delayed by nearly four years, despite being on time and on budget when this mayor took office. Due to open in December 2018, 
After multiple delays, it is now not expected until mid-2022. The delay has cost TfL £3.9 billion in bailouts and £1.35 billion in lost fares revenue. TfL's debt has rocketed to a record £11.7 billion. Million. 21 major transport projects have been delayed or cancelled. The bill for TfL staff on trade union duties has almost doubled. TfL's nominee passes, which essentially lets um, the housemate or lodger of anyone working for TfL ride for free on a tube network, cost an estimated £44 million in lost fares. The amount TfL spends on executive pay is ballooned. The number of staff has raised on over £100,000 a year has raised by nearly 100 in the last four years. TfL's performance-related pay bonus has gone up by nearly a third, from £8.3 million in 2017 to £11.8 million in 2019. Fair dodging is estimated to cost £400 million. £12.3 million wasted on the Rotherhide crossing, £20 million on Woolwich Will ferries, and the list goes on. Now, as pointed out by our excellent candidate for Croydon and Sutton on the London Assembly, Neil Garrett, this has had an effect on boroughs like mine in Sutton. In a London Assembly report released last year, it was shown that Sutton was dead last for investment from City Hall out of all the London boroughs, and this is pre-pandemic. This means that the future of transport projects like the Tramlink extension to Sutton, which our London Assembly member Steve O'Connell has been championing for a long time now, is in jeopardy. Now, it is fair to say that we are going to be living with the effects of the pandemic for some time, and that includes transport in London. The government is expecting TfL to prepare proposals for achieving financial sustainability by the 11th of January 2021, in advance of a long-term solution for TfL's finances being announced before the second bailout expires in March. This long-term package must address the huge wastage that I have outlined and not punish Londoners for the cost of the pre-pandemic mismanagement of TfL's finances. But ultimately, this comes down to the political choices of the mayor. And in May next year, petitioners will have their choice to choose. Four more years of waste and higher costs with the current mayor or getting TfL's finances under control and delivering a better deal for Londoners with Sean Bailey. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 331453 relating to funding for transport for London. Now, colleagues, uh, some people have withdrawn from the call list, but others are not here, but they may turn up. So our best guess, if everyone speaks for five or six minutes at the most, everyone will be called. Mr Andy Slaughter. Thank you very much, uh, Sir David. It's a real pleasure to be here under your... Chairmanship this afternoon. Five minutes is quite a generous uh, uh, allocation compared with a, a lot of occasions. So thank you very much for, for that as well. And I, I, I thank the Petitions Committee for facilitating the, this debate. And I thank the Honourable Member for um, uh, opening the debate. But I have to say, the speech was disappointing because it you know, very crudely politicised this issue. And, that, well, but, and, we, and we know why, because if the mayoral election next year, and the Conservative Party has a pretty duff candidate, I know, because he ran against me in, in 2010 in Hammersmith. They're 20% behind the poll. There it is. See, I'm now making a political speech, Sir David, but that's what happens. That's what happens. These are issues which are, which are whether we're talking about the ones that affect our individual constituencies or London as a whole, which really we should have each be able to reach agreement on. Well, there's been a 90, there was a 90% fall in revenue for TfL as a consequence of COVID. So to go around pretending that it's something to do with uh, this decision or that decision of the mayor is frankly ridiculous. And the public think we're ridiculous if we do that. But as those points are made in a debate in this place, therefore we have to rebut them. So therefore we will go round and round in ever decreasing circles in that way we are. So I, I, I'm sorry, the Honourable Gentleman chose um, three positions to make it. I will accept one intervention. I can never refuse my own. Does he find it curious that the introductory speech failed to mention the expenditure on the garden bridge? <laughs> it's Randy Slaughter. Well, again, uh, I mean, this, 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 is, this, is where we are, this is where we're going, and, and I hope the Honourable Gentleman is now shamefacedly regretting his, 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 his opening uh, speech in that way. And if I may be indulged for... Um, uh, 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 in terms of my speech, I will speak for a couple of minutes on the general issue and then a couple of minutes on something very dear to my heart and to many other members in South and West London, which is, which is Hammersmith Bridge. Um, uh, indeed. The, um, uh, the, the figures show that the current mayor 
managed TfL's finances immeasurably better than his predecessor, and indeed in a very efficient way. So the deficit, operating deficit, was reduced by over 70%. The cash balance increased by, uh, by 13%. And the fares freeze, of course, which was wonderful for London, as opposed to the 42% rise in fares that the previous mayor oversaw, if we hadn't had the fares freeze, of course, there'd be a bigger gap to fill now. So even basic maths seem to escape um, government members when, when talking about these issues. Uh, a bailout was necessary. Does anybody in this debate deny that a bailout was necessary or that a bailout is appropriate? But we have to have six months bailouts. We can't have a longer term to allow better planning because, of course, they want to continue this story running and they want to have another uh, artificial row with a 17 minutes to midnight, uh, 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 last minute piece of, piece of blackmail just before the election's coming up. It really is transparent and it's not worthy, frankly, of the, the way that the, the government has, uh, uh, is, is dealing with, with this issue. And I wish they would stop politicking in this obvious way because the only people who suffer... The only people who suffer from this are our constituents. And the things that they targeted, the progressive policies of TfL over the years, like the under-18s travel card, the over-60s travel card, perhaps I should declare an interest as of about a month ago in relation to that. Uh, those are the things that were targeted. And the congestion charge, I remember the huge fuss about the congestion charge extension and getting that withdrawn, but suddenly we're told that the government wants to have a, a congestion charge extending to the north and south circular, which would have, which have virtually brought London to, to, a, to a halt in that way. So, please, can we just have a little bit of common sense in relation to this? And nowhere is that needed more than on the issue of Hallisith Bridge, a major strategic river crossing, uh, not just of concern to me as a member of Hallisith, very much of concern to my uh, friend, the member for... For, for, for Richmond Park, and I'm sure we will hear later from the, the member for Wandsworth, and I know the member for Rental Advisors will be here if possible. But really, this affects a whole swathe of London and the South East. I had a whole debate on that subject here in March. I thought we were making some progress, but it's always Groundhog Day. And the thing that's brought the, brought the progress we were making, because TfL and Houses Council, between them, were making progress in drawing up a full schedule of repairs for the bridge, is the, is the task force that was set up by the government, which has brought everything shuddering to a halt, as task force so often do. And uh, this is, a, this is a, a national, if not international, embarrassment now that we cannot repair a major uh, river crossing. It's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to cost more than £150 million. Pounds. And every day I look at the, the Bridges Minister's um, uh, Twitter feed and she is announcing uh, another £100 million pounds here or there for road and bridge schemes around the country. And on average, about 85 to 90% of that is paid by central government. But th apparently that doesn't go for, for Hammersmith Bridge. And so I hope all London members will support me uh, in saying that this is about time that the government set an example here in a major piece of London infrastructure which can only be funded through central government. TfL, we know, doesn't. Neither does Hampton's Council, neither does Richmond Council have the means to do this, and it needs to be funded now. Last week, the leader of Hampton's Council announced a, a proposal by Sir John Ripplatt and Norman Foster to, for a, a very innovative scheme to put a temporary crossing in place which will allow, within a relatively short period of time, traffic to go over, the, over the, the river at that point as well and under the river at that point as well. That was work that was done by the local authority working with the, the private sector in that way. It still needs funding and unless we have that funding, unless that funding comes forward quickly, then my constituents and many others across London will continue to suffer, not for weeks or months, but for years without the basic facility that that provides. And that had an extraordinary delegate, derogation of duty by, by the government. Again, but patently party political methods because we have the Secretary of State or the mayoral candidate for the Conservatives announcing every five minutes, yes, don't worry, if you just vote for us, you can have the money. I'm afraid that doesn't cut any ice, uh, Sir David. Uh, what my constituents and others want is the bridge repaired. They don't want silly party political squabbles and game playing over the issue. So let's have some response to that. If you can get it from the Minister today, that would be most helpful. Mr Gareth Baker. 
So David, sorry, you caught me slightly on the hop there. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to serve under your chairmanship uh, this evening. And now, at the outset, I think it's important to say that Transport for London is critical to the functioning of the city. It's vital for the economic and well social well-being of London. And these days, although it's unfashionable to say so, London is the economic motor of the UK economy. And if TfL doesn't function, London doesn't function, and the knock-on effect of the country is inestimable. So it is right that the government has stepped in. It's worth pointing out that neither Transport for London nor the government are responsible for the health crisis that we are in at the moment. It is true, as both my honourable friend, the Member for Carshorton and Wallington, and the honourable gentleman, the Member for Hammersmith, have pointed out in their speeches, that the pandemic has devastated Transport for London's finances. That is a fact, and it's not open to debate. So it's right that the government has stepped in twice over a six-month period to the tune of £3.3 billion, and that cost is borne by the UK taxpayer collectively. Now, there's been much comment that uh, certain benefits enjoyed by Londoners pre-pandemic are not being covered by the bailout agreements. And I think it's important to note that at pre-pandemic levels, there was over a billion pounds of subsidy within Transport for London's uh, transport uh, provision. Over £700 million of that went into buses, but there were also £330 million of other concessions. The government's position on this, in both of the bailout agreements, is that it would be inequitable to taxpayers across the country to pay for subsidised travel that is not enjoyed elsewhere. Why, Sir David, should taxpayers in London, Manchester, sorry, in Liverpool, Manchester and Birmingham pay for a benefit that Londoners enjoy that is not enjoyed by the citizens of those cities? Now, London's Deputy Mayor for Transport, speaking on behalf of the Mayor, has pushed back against this. And she stated that this amounts to levelling down and that Londoners are more dependent on public transport. Now, I think that there is something in that argument. But the financial management at City Hall over the past four years leaves a lot to be desired. The Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Hammersmith, uh, criticised my Honourable Friend, the uh, Member for uh, Carshorton and Wallington, when he said that he crudely politicised this issue. Has he ever met Sadiq Khan? <laughs> I can't imagine a politician in this country alive today who doesn't miss an opportunity to crudely politicise any issue at all. And there are other facts, and, and these were laid out at, at some length by my Honourable Friend. Uh, the fares freeze, the partial fares freeze, as it should be called, because it isn't a complete fares freeze. Now, much, I'm sure, will be made of Labour members when they come to speak about the withdrawal of the revenue grant from Transport for London's budget. They won't acknowledge that much of that is replaced by business rates, but they will harp on about the £700 million, and they are right to draw attention to that, because that has harmed Transport for London's finances. But that didn't happen in one year, or overnight. It was phased in over a three-year period. The first year of that took place under the previous mayor. So candidate Khan, before he became Mayor Khan, knew about this. He knew this money was going to disappear. And he still recklessly pledged a fares freeze, a partial fares freeze for the next four years in order to help garner votes to get himself elected. And Transport for London's costings of this, at that time, were £1.9 billion. Then they watered it down a few weeks later because the commissioner was desperate to keep his job to £640 million. And that's the figure that they are sticking at at the moment. On top of that, we have, as, as my honourable friend has referred to, the massive delay to Crossrail. Four years and nearly £4 billion late. And that's going to cost over £1.6 billion in unachieved fares revenue. These things don't help. And this has happened. Now, they will say, and the Mayor has been saying this ad nauseum, well, of course, this is a co-sponsored project between the Department of Transport and Transport for London. True. But actually, Transport for London is the delivery arm of that project and always was. Because Crossrail Limited, who the Mayor likes to blame, is a wholly owned subsidiary of Transport for London. And who chairs Transport for London? The Mayor of London. Crossrail's delay can be laid squarely at the feet of Sadiq Khan. We've heard about the delay to the capital projects. The 21 capital projects have been delayed. We've heard about some of the fringe benefits, the TFR nominee pass scheme. Um, we've heard about, well, we haven't heard about this, trade union facility time at Transport for London has more than doubled under Sadiq Khan. We have now... Um, more, 81 people, it's, it's more than double the number of people that spend more than half of their time working solely on trade union facility activities. That's more than the whole of the civil service put together. And we've also seen other examples of Sidiq Khan's wasteful approach to management. Staffing at City Hall has gone up by 82% staff costs at City Hall, 82% in four years. Does anybody believe that London is 82% better governed now than it was in 2016? Anyone at all? Of course not. The Mayor's press office has increased by 33% since 
since Sadiq Khan took office. We've had other really good headline-grabbing things, such as £800,000 spent on beach parties in 2018, and in 2019, £10 million spent by the Metropolitan Police to put every police officer over the rank of sergeant through a personality test to assign a colour to their personality. Apparently that was critical. £10 million was spent on that by this Mayor of London. So David, we're living in extraordinary times. The government is dealing with an unprecedented health crisis. There is no manual for how to do this. And the government interventions, if they go to the full extent that were announced by the Chancellor last week, will amount to £280 billion. And these are very, very extensive. In London, the government's demonstrated its commitment to maintaining the core functions of the Transport for London by injecting £3.3 billion of UK tax money, taxpayers' money to keep Transport for London afloat. And I don't think that anybody in this room will argue with that. But under the circumstances, given the fact that the benefits in question are not enjoyed outside London, and the fact that City Hall under Sadiq Khan has been so wasteful of public money, it is hardly surprising that the government should expect City Hall to fund the retention of such benefits. Thank you, Sir David. Order. I now have to impose a formal time limit of five minutes. Catherine West. Oh, it's an honour to serve under your chairmanship, but not an honour and not pleasant <laughs> to hear that I've been cut back by a minute. However, I will... Um, I'm very happy to speak in the debate and to hear honourable members. And it's quite fun to have a little bit of old-fashioned political banter, I think, after what has been a pretty heavy six months on coronavirus and everything else. So it's quite fun to have a bit of um, talking about bridges and things. So, yeah. um, Mr Amos, um, Sir David, you would know um, that what many transport authorities are trying to do across the world is to shift us all out of our cars um, and onto trains, buses, cycles and walking. And that's having a bit of a hiccup at the moment because of coronavirus. But I know that we do all agree of the importance of clean air. Um, and many of you will have read the tragic story of nine-year-old Ella Kissa Debra, who tragically died from asthma. Um, and she um, has just been given a further legal... Her family's been given a further legal attempt to try to... Um, make us learn more about how we can have an impact on clean air in London. Um, and I'm really pleased that we're not any more at loggerheads about how transport's going to be paid for. I was panicking for a moment there a couple of week, weeks back around the congestion charge and the under-18s travel and so on. And the Child Poverty Action Group does make the point that the zip card is incredibly important for young Londoners. And as we all know, young people have been so badly affected by coronavirus that it would just be awful if they had to then um, be affected doubly by having the, the zip cards taken away. Um, we also know that um, in areas like mine, that London Borough of Haringey, 182% increase in unemployment, and of that, a huge whack of youth unemployment. Um, and so anything that we can do to help young people get to job interviews or apprenticeships or to college or to their sixth form in the way of transport helps enormously. And I think we can all appreciate in this room as London MPs, and we don't get that many opportunities to do this, so it's quite fun, um, that when we talk about levelling up and all that, there's many, many people who live on extremely low incomes in our city. Um, and while we all have an enormous amount of sympathy for people in Liverpool and people in Manchester and everything, we have massive um, deprivation in London. And if you count the actual numbers, there's more people living in deprivation in London than there is outside it. I completely agree with the levelling up agenda, but I also think it should apply to London boroughs. Um, and our boroughs do an, a fantastic job, and I think so does TfL, and so do all of our um, London government arrangements, when you think that actually they're really in often run on the smell of an oily rag. Um, I am very sorry that I think that in the coming um, six months, all of our residents are going to have to pay more tax because I think that what was announced last week from the Chancellor will mean that every London borough will probably have to put up tax um, and also that um, the Mayor of London will have to put up the precept, probably. Now, I think that is a terrible pity, really, because right at the moment, um, the IMF and other groups have said that we shouldn't be 
um, levying more money from citizens because it's a, such a tough time for people with businesses, with struggling with their jobs, with now we know there's going to be a public sector pay freeze. Um, this really isn't the time to be putting council tax up and I think that's very regressive um, and I think it's a typical wheeze from central government to make local governments pay more, um, in, you know, in, impose more tax and I think that's um, a real pity. Um, I briefly also wanted to uh, mention the fact that um, I would like to see, um, because the, the, the housing market's quite buoyant at the moment, um, I would really like to see us collectively working together as London MPs on how we could have developers share a bit more of the transport burden. I know that there's a big change going on with CIL into other arrangements and so on, but um, I think it would be very useful at a future point to look at the transport element um, and how much more can be done if our housing market remains as buoyant as it currently is because I think there's much, much more that we could be doing there when we see a lot of the developers going home with these huge bonuses at the end of the annual um, financial year when so many of our residents are struggling on tiny incomes. There must be a way there of getting them to pay for many more of the transport improvements which we so desperately need to have the clean air, to have the standard of living and to have cohesive communities, which is something which we all seek. Thank you, Sir David. Nikki Aiken. Thank you, Sir David. And it is a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And I uh, welcome this uh, debate brought by my honourable friend, the member for Carl Shorten and Wallington. I declare an interest before I start. I have two teenagers who do enjoy the under-18s free travel uh, at the moment. I recognise the huge detrimental effect that COVID-19 has had on TfL's finances. Anyone using the tube or bus will know the dramatic fall in passenger numbers. I travelled here this afternoon on the tube and the numbers of people on, in the carriage and in the stations, you know, they are empty. But I think we need to accept that the rot in the TfL finances had set in way before COVID and much of the blame for the reason TfL is in such an awful mess can be laid at Mayor Khan's door. The loss of the government's decision to phase out the operating revenue element of the TfL grant, yes, had some effect. Losing £700 million a year would have been difficult to absorb, but the Mayor knew this before he took over and stood for election and made his uh, fair freeze. There was no strategic thinking about uh, what could happen in City Hall once he was elected and to in introduce a major fare freeze across the network despite advice from his own transport commissioner not to do so, he ignored. And that led to an extra loss of 640 million on top of the 700 million, which then led the mayor having over a billion pound loss before he'd even done his first year. Um, the ill thought, this whole, this whole issue has also led to at the same time, a fall in passenger numbers, a triple whammy, if you think about it. And this was even before the COVID struck. Um, and in my own constituency now, people are feeling the effects of the, uh, the inability of the mayor to be able to now invest in the infrastructure. The people in Pimlico, uh, I may um, add, are desperately needing uh, the, the, the tube to be upgraded because of the terrible noise they have to deal with and the mayor and his own deputy have made personal promises to the people of Pimlico which now can't be kept. Uh, one of the big issues that has really affected my constituency of the cities of London and Westminster has been the extension of the congestion charge and the number of constituents and businesses have come to me to say they are so concerned about the extension in uh, um, up to 10 o'clock at night, Monday to Friday, and then also the extension now on Saturdays and Sundays as well. Many people now uh, d describe it now as a two-tier system because the mayor at the same time as extending the uh, congestion charge has also stopped the resident discount. Now, from the 1st of August, it means now that it, no matter how long you've been living within the congestion charge zone, your circumstances may change. You may get older. You may become frail. You may have children that you need, that are infirmed, that you need to travel around and use a car. They can no longer uh, benefit from the 90% uh, 
uh, reduction and that is having a massive issue. Um, I've had doctors, pharmacists, foster carers, charity workers, market traders all say to me that the extension of the congestion charge and the ending of the discount is making a, having a real detrimental fact, uh, effect on their lives. One doctor who came to me um, lives in Westminster, has now been posted out onto the Surrey border. Uh, he wanted to use his car because of the, the times of his shifts, um, and he now um, has to drive, and that now adds uh, 15 pounds extra onto his daily commute. Um, I had a, a market trader in Covent Garden who said to me she works two days a week on Saturdays and Sundays. It's her own small business. It's now added the congestion charge on a Saturday and Sunday has added 1,500 pounds to her bottom line. At a time when we are trying to have an economic recovery, um, this is another blow to small businesses. Why can't? the mayor consider the gross um, overexpenditure that he has, um, he has introduced. The pensions within TfL. Um, the employees now have a 31% contribution from their employer compared to 13% for doctors and nurses and police officers and firemen and teachers. Why should TfL employ employees benefit from that? Why has there been an increase of... Uh, but nearly 100 people who now earn £100,000 in TfL. All this fat could be cut so that TfL could um, keep the fares um, for under-18s and the over-60s. It's got to change. The Mayor has got to be held to account on this, Sir David. Mr Stephen Hammond. Thank you, Sir David. I was, uh, thought I had a few minutes before my time. It's a great honour to serve under your chairmanship this evening. And can I congratulate my honourable friend from Carl Sheldon and Wallington in securing this debate. So, David, it, you will understand that it pains me to agree with the honourable member for Hammersmith, which I do rarely. <laughs> Although this is the second time in a London uh, debate I have done so. For he is right, Sir David, we would look ridiculous if we were trying to say in tonight's debate that there have not been a, fa a, a fall in passenger numbers and that it has not been a financial consequence for TfL. We clearly are, and no one is saying that. And as so many people have already pointed out, the funding packages that the government has put in twice now, 1.7 billion earlier in the year, and the previous support, sorry, 1.7 billion earlier this month, and the previous package of 1.6 billion, 3.3 billion. Ridership has dropped across whole networks. No one is saying that. That is not what we are discussing this evening. What we are discussing this evening is whether or not the impact of this mayor's decisions had an impact on the finances of TSL, TfL private, prior to COVID. And whether one likes it or not, Sir David, the answer to that question is a resounding yes. The Honourable Member for Hammersmith spoke about the fact that this mayor has improved various positions. But none of this was a surprise to this mayor. For back in 2014, it was set out that the debt position of TfL and a sustainable funding would need to be put in place. And it was recognised prior to the 2016, uh, 2016 mayoral election that £16 billion of savings would have to be made by 2022 in comparison to receiving other uh, financial resources. £12 billion of those were already found prior to the mayor taking office. There were, so the idea that this mayor has been hugely successful in finding any of those uh, savings is a complete nonsense. And if you look at the agreement that the mayor has signed alongside this funding package, it recognises explicitly that he has not done enough or, uh, during this period and during his term of office to find any more of those savings and any more of those benefits. Because finding those savings, I won't reiterate uh, the remarks from my honourable friend for Cities of London, Westminster, and my honourable friend here about exactly where uh, a number of the failings on Crossrail, on the fact that the pay-as-you-go freeze uh, has not benefited Londoners as, as something might have travel, as travel cards might have done more, it's the fact that £640 million has been lost in revenue. The fact of the matter is that if you look at the agreement that the Mayor has signed with the Government for this funding package, it explicitly recognises that his financial, his financial management has not been good enough. 
which is why in a major section of that uh, agreement points out that there is a further range of operating efficiencies that he has failed to find that he needs to find. It points out that there is an assessment of capital efficiencies and a review of the long-term capital plan needs to be put in place and it's only being done because it's part of the conditions that are with this package. And finally, uh, Sir David, looking at that uh, agreement, it is extraordinary that actually the Mayor has not proceeded as there were plans under the previous Mayor and the previous administration, at T the Commissioner, Commissioner at TfL, to go through the non-operational assets that are not generating any revenue and could be utilised and either utilised or sold off. And this has direct impacts. It has direct impacts on exactly what we're talking about, about the free travel for under-18s and over-60s, which we're talking about this evening. And the fact it is good that the government package recognises that and ensures that's going to continue. But it also has direct consequences for my constituents. The previous mayor knew the value of infrastructure and invested in new trains for the district line. As a result of the 21 projects being delayed or some indeed being cancelled infrastructure projects, some of the upgrades of the district line, which is key to the livelihoods of so many of my constituents, has not happened. And that is a direct consequence of this Mayor's financial mismanagement. And Mr David, if these conditions that this, this agreement did, imposed on the Mayor were not in place, the free travel for under 18-year-olds and over 60-year-olds, which is now protected, would be at risk. And that's what we're talking about this evening. Not what, what, not what COVID has caused, but what was happening prior. Yeah, yeah. Sam Turley. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sir David, and an honour to serve under your chairmanship. And thank you to the Honourable Member for Carshalton and Wallington and the Petitions Committee for this evening's debate. Um, I'll just declare an interest at the beginning of this, uh, to draw your attention to my register of interests, but also declare an interest that I was proudly a trade union officer dealing with Transport for London at the time of the previous Conservative Mayor and seeing firsthand the insane obsession with £400,000 buses, failing schemes that cost an eye-watering amount of money that didn't even build a bridge over the Thames in terms of the Garden Bridge. And so to take lectures from members across the other side of the House about some of the, perhaps to use one of the Prime Minister's terms, poppycock, that they are saying tonight is simply unbelievable. Let's be honest here about the real root cause of this problem, because it goes back, they are right, beyond COVID. It goes back to the cutting of the operating grant. London and its transport system for a long time has been the jewel in the crown of this country's transport infrastructure. Every major line and railway stops and finishes here to serve the rest of our nation as their economic engine. And yet, we are the only country in Western Europe to have pulled nearly a billion pounds of the main subsidy from that very transport system. A transport system that moves millions and millions of people in and out of London every single day. That is the root cause of this problem. And I've seen that firsthand in terms of the way that the previous mayor and now this mayor have had to suffer the consequences of that decision. And there does, in all honesty, need to be a settlement, a real settlement, that is actually one that's sustainable for Londoners. Because actually, as colleagues on both sides of this House have said, the reality is that London is an economic driver. And although many people at the moment are clearly having to work at home, and that may be a fundamental change, the reality is TfL is not going to be able to wash its face when 70% of its fares, even now, have gone completely. I would also say that the Mayor of London, let's give him credit where credit's due, he successfully forced the government to give up its plans to scrap free travel for older and younger Londoners alongside its ill-conceived attempts, which I will be honest almost caused a riot, the attempts that were being put to bring to my constituency, Ilford South, along the border of the A406, the plans for the extension of the congestion charge. That, indeed, colleagues, was a nakedly political move to hit the Mayor of London, and one that I believe would be deeply unpopular in East London, as it would be in, in many of our colleagues in West London as well, and clearly was thrown straight out the window when constituents made their voices heard. And once again, we know that those negotiations went right down to the wire. The funding deal agreed by the government only 17 minutes before the deadline. This is not a way to run 
a system that supports millions of people travelling to work, even in a COVID crisis situation. And yet the deal came with huge strings, £160 million in additional savings this financial year. And all of this stuff about facility time for trade unions, under Sadiq, their relationships have been far, far better than they had under Boris. He wouldn't even pick up the phone to me or any of my colleagues for four years. Megaphone diplomacy through the pages of the Evening Standard is not the way to run our capital city's transport system. And despite what was written in black and white, in a letter from the Transport Secretary to the Mayor, the Government, and of course Sean Bailey, the Conservative candidate, are now pretending that the Mayor, Sadiq, chose to impose those conditions on Londoners. Londoners are not going to be taken for fools. They also know that what the Prime Minister said wrongly on the floor of the House, that you know, the Mayor had bankrupted TfL before the pandemic. This is simply, to use another phrase of our Prime Minister, border dash, absolute nonsense. There is no possible way that we wouldn't have had to have radical change when 90% of footfall disappears almost overnight. But let me turn quickly to what we're here tonight to discuss, which is the knock-on impact of all of this um, financial uh, crisis, is that young people in my constituency in Ilford South, one of the most diverse in the whole of London, are now facing having their zip card the card that allows them to travel across London and when we're out of COVID to visit the museums, to go to the local library and study, taken away from them. They are the people whose very parents, and Child Poverty Action Group has said this as well, were making decisions about not putting food on the table because they suddenly are going to have to pay for our child's travel to get to school. And let's not have a north-south divide. Why not level up the north rather than level down London? Abino Pongasari. Thank you, Sir David. Um, it's an honour to um, be under your chairmanship. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to thank the Honourable Member for Cosharton and Wellington for bringing forward this debate. I think it's a really important debate for us to have across the political parties. Um, I also wanted to talk about um, the number of constituents from Erith and Tensmead that signed the petitions for calls to remove free transport for under-18s to be scrapped. I received so many emails from constituents that were concerned about this. I also met so many young people and the impact on this would have been absolutely devastating if this was to continue. I know that this decision will have an impact on so many of their lives and the families' lives and during that summer. I will share with members the issues impacting my constituents shortly, but I must first begin by setting the record straight on why we are in this situation right now. Despite the appalling circumstances under TfL, though, which were forced to suspend free travel for under 18s, the government is pretending that the Mayor of London chose to implement these decisions. In fact, it was the Mayor that was forced to accept the devastating bailout at last minute, which really punishes Londoners for doing the right thing by following the COVID-19 restrictions. Sir David, the Prime Minister has also wrongly said on the floor of the House that the Mayor bankrupted TfL before the pandemic. In the four years Sadiq Khan has been Mayor of London, he has fixed the financial mess he inherited from TfL from the previous mail. He has reduced the operational deficit of TfL by 71% and increased cash reserves by 13%. With the delay of Crosswell in Abbey Wood, the government has said that London should be cover the projected funding gap facing the Crossworld project, despite it jointly sponsored project with the government, which brings economic benefits across Erith and Thamesmead and beyond. During COVID-19 lockdown, TfL funding from fares dropped by 90%, and due to the dodgy deal struck between the current Prime Minister and George Osborne in 2015, removing TfL's government grant, London has only been the major city in Western Europe that hasn't received direct government funding to run day-to-day -day transport services in the last few years, meaning it relies heavily on funding from passengers fares. Instead of working with the Mayor to ensure transport in London could continue to operate uh, for people as we come out of lockdown, the government has forced the Mayor to accept a bad deal which has since been used as a political campaigning tool. 
We can't afford to pay politics with people's lives, which is why the government must accept that the suspension of free travel for under-18s will have absolutely devastating consequences on my constituents and ensure that the mayor is not forced into this position again next year. This summer, I spoke to young people, as I mentioned earlier, about COVID-19, how it's impacted them. And one of the main issues um, that was raised was the fear of not being able to afford to go to school following that decision. A young person in my constituency said, as, an, as, a, as, a, as a young person from a family whose income has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, this will change and hurt my family's finances by paying for travel when we are barely able to afford it, before I, like many under 18s, rely on public transport every day to get to and from school. By doing this, many children from low income families will not afford to go back to school or go back home. Please stop this. The government is supposed to work to protect people and ensure that everyone can have equal opportunities and life chances, yet they continue to put the economic burden of COVID-19 on the most disadvantaged in society. Thousands of households in Irith and Thamesmead have seen their income slush during COVID-19. I am pleased that the Mayor has been able to reverse this appalling decision and secure free travel for under-18s until March 2021. But this uncertainty beyond that, combined with the added uncertainty of job losses, business closures, is causing so much stress for um, families across London. Young people shouldn't have to pay for COVID-19 with their right to education, culture and safety. And I sincerely hope the government will take the time to ensure that cuts to free travel for under 18s will not be forced on the mayor in, in 2021. Thank you. Mr. David Simmons. Sir David, a pleasure. We've heard many uh, very sensible contributions from members uh, across the issues in this debate tonight. I'd like to focus in particular on those that we experience in my constituency and many other parts of London towards the outer edge of the suburbs in Zone 6. For those who've not had the pleasure to visit Harefield in my constituency, uh, it is well known as the last village in London to the northwest. To get there, you have to travel through proper English countryside surrounded by fields with grazing livestock, woods, certainly does not feel like a part of our capital. And although it is served by a small number of bus routes laid on by TfL, we have to recognise that for residents there and in many other parts of the outer suburbs, the subsidy that is provided to travel only helps if you can access the transport network reliably. For many places where there simply is not access to trains and tubes. That means that there is a restriction on the benefit that they see. And for many of my constituents in a place which is much more dependent upon the car than most of London, and also home to many uh, cabbies and minicab drivers, the services that TfL operates to keep our traffic moving are also enormously significant, although afforded rather less tension under what feels like very much a zone one mayor than we've seen historically. We do need to recognise that all of Londoners need to benefit from the services provided by TfL and huge fan though I and my children in particular are there is no greater pleasure than standing on the bridge and watching the tube trains coming in and out and working out which of the bus routes go where we need to make sure that we are providing value for money for all Londoners in the way that TfL carries out its operations. Now, at the heart of tonight's debate is the impact on children and young people of the changes that have taken place and that will take place in the future. Now, London's local authorities have for a long time had programmes including the Safer Routes to School scheme to encourage children both to walk and cycle to their local school. There is the Home School Transport legislation which sets out a framework of distance around those routes. And, of course, local authorities, in planning the new schools that have been required to meet the rising numbers of children in London, have always been cognizant of the distance to make sure that, as far as possible, every mum and dad, every child, has access to a good local school. And it is, therefore, a reasonable challenge to TfL to recognise that a very significant proportion of the journeys that are undertaken by children 
are those going to school for well under the statutory distances. And therefore, I think it is a reasonable challenge that transport commissioners need to look at and say, given the difficult times that we face, the need to ensure there is proper social distancing on public transport, how do we manage that challenge as effectively as possible? But ultimately, Sir David, what this debate is about is not the niceties of the bailout package. A mayor of whichever political party needs to show that the fate of London is genuinely in his hands, that he is willing to take ownership of the challenges that present, whether it is COVID as today, or indeed the many other challenges that our city has faced in the past, and that the response that comes out of City Hall will command the confidence of all Londoners. And the challenge that we face, Sir David, at present, is that Sadiq Khan comes across as a nice, quite affable chap. He is clearly very good at PR, but he is just not very competent at managing the services and the finances of our capital city, not just in respect of TfL, but so many other things like the police. And we need to make sure that we bring about a change in City Hall that ensures that our city and my constituents have a sense that they have a leader in City Hall who can command their confidence and understands and is interested in the issues that concern them in the suburbs. That's why we need a change in the mayoral elections when they come up next year. Bambus Sharal Ambus. Uh, thanks, David, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Uh, for the purpose of this debate, I'm going to focus on the actual e-petition, which was about the removal of the free travel for under-18s. The threat of removal of the uh, under-18s free travel in London caused deep anger and concern, not just amongst young people, but across the wider community. And it's testament to their campaigning and determination that the government have backtracked on this demand. And when making this demand, I don't think the government understood what free travel actually meant to the under-18s. So I asked Enfield's Youth Parliament what free travel meant to them. Tara Larkin, who's a member of the Youth Parliament, told me that free travel gives young people a social life and a chance for independence. And this is really important for young people's mental health, especially during the pandemic. Other members of the Youth Parliament told me that they need free travel to tra travel to and from school and college, to provide care and support family members, to travel to work, to travel for cultural, community and religious activities, and also to socialise with friends. And one thing that was very clear from their responses was that how much they value this one small benefit that they have. The Child Poverty Action Group uh, found that 37% of London's children live in relative poverty, and free travel for under-18s is a lifeline for many teenagers. So how did we get to the situation when the government was ordering the removal of free travel for under-18s in London? Well, back in March, during the first lockdown, the instruction from the government was, work at home if you can. And the overwhelming majority of people did just that. And in the early months of the pandemic, underground and rail passenger usage plummeted. And according to the DFT's own statistics, this drop was by over 90%. And for bus travel, it was over 80%. And during those early days, there was a worrying news of committed transport workers who contracted COVID-19 during their ordinary daily work routine. And the sad reality was that for some of them, the illnesses ended in death. And people were rightly frightened to use public transport. And as bus and train usage plummeted, so did the income from passenger numbers everywhere. Both Transport for London and the national train operators sought help from the government. Now, we don't know what, if any, conditions were attached to the five billion bailout for the national train operators because the government haven't released the figures or the details of that, not even to the Transport Select Committee. But I'm pretty sure that those conditions didn't remove uh, any perks or benefits for their passengers. What we do know is that there, there were conditions attached to TfL's bailout. And we now know in the letter to the Mayor of London on the 14th of May 2020 that the Secretary of State made a number of demands as conditions of the bailout. And one of those demands was bringing forward proposals as soon as practical for the suspension of free travel for under 18s, subject to discussions as to how it is to be operationalised. And the rationale for this decision was to optimise the use of the available safe transport capacity. But we know from the government's own statistics that on the day the letter was written, underground usage was only 6% 
and bus usage in London was only 13%. So the demands on the letter seem to make little logical sense. And it seems to me that the conditions contained in the letter were ill-conceived and poorly thought out. Now, some people might say that these were demands set out in order to score political points against Sadiq Khan in the forthcoming mayoral elections. Um, and I'm happy to have that row another time. Uh, and there's plenty of months ahead for us to have that uh, contest. Um, but either way, the Department of Transport has failed to understand the reasons why young people use the free travel for their, in their under-18s travel card. So what would happen would be that we would end up punishing young people who have already had to endure the government's um, fiasco over exams and free school meals and whose mental health is already suffering due to all the uncertainty surrounding their future. And with future negotiations due over the months ahead for a uh, further extension of the bailout from the government for TfL, uh, I say to the Minister, the kids have suffered enough. Don't mess around with their free travel. Let, their kids have their, let the kids have their freedom. Sarah Olney. Thank you very much, Sir David. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Uh, it's, uh, it's obviously been quite amusing to listen to my uh, fellow MPs here talk about whether it's the current mayor or the previous mayor who is more to blame for the, uh, the current state of TfL's finances. Uh, but there's no doubt at all that whatever decisions have been made by either mayor in the past were made in a pre-pandemic phase. And the situation we are in now could not have been anticipated by anybody. Uh, TfL income is actually almost unique uh, in the world for a capital city in coming 80% of it comes from fair income uh, and that's quite unprecedented amongst uh, capital cities most of which enjoy a far greater level of government subsidy so there is no doubt that when something like the pandemic comes along and the instruction is given to Londoners to stay home and not use public transport that there will be a big impact on finances. Londoners have done exactly what they were supposed to do. They stopped using the tubes. They stopped using the buses. And therefore, we see the subsequent impact on income, which has got nothing to do with the mayoral policies, either of the current mayor or any previous mayor. It is not a, a, a situation that could have been predicted. So the situation that we're in now is that TfL have not, um, surprisingly, required a bailout in order to maintain its services. And where we are now is we need to look forward. We don't need to look back at which mayor was responsible for, uh, for previous finances. We need to look forward. What is the plan now for keeping our public transport going in London? And I was really um, disturbed last week at the Comprehensive Spending Review to see that the government have not budgeted anything in the next financial year for any further bailouts for TfL. Now, as I said last week, I'm very encouraged that the, uh, about the implication that that means for the vaccine rollout, that we will be back to full capacity on our tubes and buses in May next year. But I, um, I'm going to be a little bit sceptical about that. Um, I have to say, I think it is a mistake for the government not to plan further investment into uh, London's transport network because we know that they, the drivers of, of the London economy are our cultural industries, our financial services, our retail sector. They've all seen a big hit from, uh, from coronavirus and potentially a big hit from Brexit. They need, uh, you know, they, they need that investment uh, from central government to get them back up and running, to get London running again on full speed, as it was before, and that investment needs to go into our public transport network. And the point was made by somebody earlier, it's not just Londoners, it's uh, travellers from abroad. And if London is to get back up and running again, it needs to welcome those travellers from abroad, and it needs that public transport network. So I'm disappointed to hear from the government that the way that they plan to finance uh, TfL is in tax rises and charges on, on Londoners. That's what we, we were told, tax, uh, council tax increases and an uh, increase in the congestion charge. Um, I want to talk particularly about the under-18s travel because there was talk of scrapping that in order to pay for the bailout uh, and lots has been talked about that and some very excellent contributions from fellow members. But I want to uh, pick up on the point that the member for Carshalton and Wallington made in his opening remarks about um, a potential uh, doubling in car usage. And can I just say, in my own uh, constituency of Richmond Park, we do not want to see a doubling in car usage. Car usage is already... Uh, a major scourge, I have to say, uh, on our roads. The congestion is terrible. The uh, impact on air pollution is terrible, the way it cuts people off from their local town centres. Uh, and um, and the, my particular concerns for young people is the impact on their safety. If they're being driven to school, if they're, uh, they're you know, increasing cars, uh, if they're being driven to school uh, instead of catching the bus, 
then their uh, um, knock-on impact on road safety, but also for those who can't afford to be driven to school and are having to walk long distances, potentially in the dark, uh, you know, I worry for their safety as well, and the knock-on impact that that might have on our policing budgets. So there are lots of impact on budgets uh, for policing and local authorities uh, that will be uh, impacted if we take away uh, free travel for under-18s, uh, and that needs to be uh, con uh, considered alongside any potential savings for TfL. It would be remiss of me not to uh, use this opportunity to talk about Hammersmith Bridge, and when I'm talking to the DFT about their long-term plans for travel in London, just please, please, can we get some, some movement on this? It is absolutely uh, uh, imperative, and it's been obvious from the start, that there needs to be a substantial contribution from DFT, and the sooner they can commit to that, the earlier we can get stabilisation works undertaken, the, the sooner we can get uh, pedestrians and cyclists back over that bridge to connect my Barnes residents to all of the services, the shops, and the transport links on the other side of the, the, the Thames, the better. Thank you very much. Flora Anderson. Thank you, Sir David. It's an honour to serve under your chairship, and thank you to the member for Carshalton and Wallington and the Petitions Committee for bringing this very important debate before us as London MPs. And thank you to the 170,000 people who signed this petition for scrapping of under-18s free travel, and to the 1,156 people from Putney who signed that petition as well and showed their support for this and also showed their support for young people and the voices of young people to be heard. It's, it's quite rare that the voices of young people are heard, but that is the focus of this debate today. I'd also like to thank all of the Transport for London workers who've worked throughout this pandemic to keep us safe in London as we travel. The plans to remove free transport for the under-18s as part of the Transport for London bailout package should never have been on the table in the first place and must now be scrapped forever. We never want to see those coming back. Free travel is essential for enabling young people from disadvantaged backgrounds to travel to school, and they can't just change schools midway because of this policy changing. They are already locked in to having to travel across London. And I declare an interest as the uh, mother of a 14-year-old um, who takes that free travel and travels across London every day to school. And it's essential for travelling to work, for apprenticeships, to get to places for sport and leisure. And to cut that off for the most disadvantaged, to cut off the best of London, but not for others, is is very, very unfair. Just before half term, when it wasn't sure whether there would be the free travel um, to being scrapped or not, one mother came to me saying she didn't know if she would be able to keep sending her son to school. Her income had gone down as a result of COVID. She had very, very tight bills. And for her, it was a choice, as with so many other families, of choosing between would it be food, would it be rent, or would it be sending their children to school. And for children who are disinclined to go to school, those most who we want to get back into school, um, this free travel is absolutely essential. There's no point in spending money on a catch-up fund for education on one side and then cutting the money for getting to school on the other side. And what was the government response to this petition? I found it very disappointing. I don't know if other members saw it, but the response was the suspension of free travel for 11 to 17 year olds will help reduce demand for public transport at peak times. Well, children have to travel on public transport at peak times. That's when school finishes, um, starts especially, and finishes. They can't choose to stay at home and choose when they travel during the day. So this can't be part of government policy. And I absolutely support Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. He's right to champion free travel for under-18s and for this to continue. And the Mayor successfully forced the government to give up its plans to scrap free travel for older and younger Londoners and the absolutely unworkable plans to extend the congestion charge to the South Circular, which I hope also never come back onto the table. All rail services have been hit by the pandemic and the government immediately bailed out private rail companies with few strings attached and the same should have happened for Transport for London. All MPs must now work together to understand the needs of young Londoners and to ensure that free travel remains. However, the now very extended closure of Hammersmith Bridge, the fantastic heritage structure of the suspension bridge, is also affecting young people travelling in London. Young people travelling to my constituency, to schools, and also out of my constituency, to neighbouring constituencies across the river, across London, are all affected by the misery that's being caused by the closure of Hammersmith Bridge. TfL was poised to fund this 
just before the pandemic, there were discussions. So Transport for London funding is very important for this. Now Transport for London clearly can't fund it. The government must step up and fund it urgently. The news that Putney boat race won't be happening in Putney um, announced just a few days ago was very, very disappointing and a huge blow for local businesses. But it's also compounding, the, the closure is compounding pollution across Putney, um, clogging up our roads, making trips to school, to work, to hospitals so much longer. The task force has been meeting for 10 weeks without very much task and without very much force. I would really like to see the Minister announcing today that there will be a change on this. Hammersmith and Fulham have done their best. They have put together a plan, they've started the restoration, they've looked into the, the danger that this bridge is potentially causing. But it's been becoming a political football far too much. It's very, very disappointing to see the candidate for the mayoral election announcing funding for the bridge left, right and centre, but it's not actually appearing at all. It's clearly just hot air. So will the Minister make a lot of people across South West London very happy and bring an edge to the misery of the Hammersbridge clo Bridge closure and announce the funding of the restoration this evening? Yeah. Matt Roder. Thank you, Sir David, and it is a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Um, I would also like to thank the uh, member for Cushalton and Wallington for opening the debate and for all those members who have taken part in this evening's discussions. I believe there have been some merit... Some, a number of excellent points made about the unfair way in which London has been treated by the government. And I want to now draw the debate back, if I may, onto one particular aspect of that potential unfairness. This is the central issue of the risk to young people's travel. The issue of funding for free transport for under-18s is an incredibly important one, and it's demonstrated not least by the number of signatures to the petition, which obviously led to the debate which we're having this evening, over 170,000 people at the last time it was checked. This um, is a truly incredible outpouring of support for the Don't Zap the Zip campaign. It's taken social media by storm over the past few months. Londoners, past and present, have shared their experiences on the scheme. And it's clear that thousands of young people rely on affordable travel in a way that is hard to imagine in some of the parts of the country. While the scheme demonstrably helps all young Londoners, the reality is that the proposals to suspend free travel for under-18s would have hit the poorest hardest. Um, this is especially true in the context of the coronavirus crisis where uh, many family finances are being deeply stretched at the present time. And I believe we should all think very deeply about that. Londoners have far less access to a car anyway than most people living elsewhere in the country. And indeed the most deprived households in London are almost five times less likely to own a car than the, than the least um, deprived. And this means that affordable public transport plays a particularly important part in levelling the playing field and helping all Londoners to get around. Uh, indeed, a YouGov survey on this issue showed that the data bears this out. 74% of children with a zip card use it to get to school or college. Uh, and it found that a further 26% of those surveyed and more than 36% from low-income families were concerned that the end of the scheme would restrict their access to school, apprenticeship or training options. All uh, so David, I'm sure we will all agree, in very important services and um, potential for uh, young people's development, which should not be restricted in any way and each should be encouraged. Furthermore, the same survey found that 33% of children would feel less safe if they were priced out of bus travel and 38% worried about being late, which is also important. Free travel is not just about ensuring children can get to school or training on time and safely. More than half the young people who use the scheme would have relied on the scheme to allow visits to cultural and other activities in central London uh, and indeed to visit friends and family, all very important parts of our shared life in the capital city and around the country. Indeed, if we want families and friends to see one another and to reduce social isolation, which is something which is obviously increasingly important at this time of the pandemic and the recovery from it, we should be encouraging young people to be able to get around, obviously in the coming months as the restrictions are eased. So, David, we should also not forget the truly important objective of promoting public transport use to reduce air pollution and carbon dioxide emissions, as a number of members have quite rightly said, um, and, and indeed related to a number of issues in their own constituencies. Uh, and so, surely, on this, um, in this context alone, this is a, a very important scheme. 
Um, I have major concerns that government decisions around funding for TfL, including the scheme, and indeed London more generally, are being, as we heard earlier, politicised in a rather sad and unfortunate way. Um, and I would urge the Minister, who's uh, uh, a thoughtful uh, Minister, to perhaps have a word with some of her colleagues to reconsider their approach, particularly at the time of, as we potentially recover from the pandemic, when we should be paying tribute also to transport workers and their contribution and trying to take this whole issue a little bit more seriously. We should also, I believe, and I hope the Minister will take this back to her colleagues, reconsider the effect of the spending review on Londoners. And as far as I can see, it did very little for London um, at a time when the capital city is under huge pressure. It reconfirmed the government's thin commitment to funding Crossrail. I, I should declare something of an interest, to put it mildly, as a member for one of the seats, which is um, a terminus for, the, for Crossrail. And there's huge potential for Crossrail to be an engine for not only the London economy, but across southern England um, and out into as far away as Oxford potentially could benefit in the western side, not least um, in, in Kent and Essex as well in the same way as I'm sure um, Sir David's own constituency possibly going to have some potential benefits from it. So I do wish ministers would, uh, the minister would look at this again. Um, the government, sadly, has been taking the Crossrail, pro Crossrail project down to the wire with the investment authority dangerously close to running out of resources and the Mayor has put forward um, London's case on this front, but it doesn't appear to have been really listened to by the Treasury. And indeed, the Mayor had to fight tooth and nail for weeks against government ministers wishing to impose punishing and damaging con conditions, as we've heard earlier. So I do hope the government will now stop paying for politics with London during the pandemic and in the aftermath, and that the ministers will think again about their overall approach. There are three requests I would make to the Minister, and I do hope that she takes these on board and takes them back to her colleagues. The first is to recognise the importance of free travel to under-18s in particular, both in supporting education and training, but on, on a whole range of fronts, the social um, and family benefits are significant as well. I hope she will also concede that promoting public transport use in major cities has a huge part to play in tackling environmental problems, as was said earlier. And finally, I hope she will urge her colleagues, as we've all said before, to rethink the overly political approach to some of these issues and to work together for the benefits of London. Minister. Thank you very much indeed, Sir David. It is a great pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and it is a real pleasure to wind up this debate. And before I get into the substance of the debate, I also want to add my voice to also pay tribute to those workers on Transport for London who've kept the services running throughout the pandemic. I do travel on the Tube regularly and I've seen the great way that they provide those services. So I want to thank my honourable friend very much uh, from Carshalton and Wallington for introducing this debate and to everybody who's contributed. We've had contributions from the member for Hammersmith, Orpington, Hornsey and Wood Green, Cities of London and Westminster, Wimbledon, Ilford South, Erith and Thamesmead, Ryslip, Northwood and Pinner, Enfield Southgate, Richmond Park and Putney. Um, it does sound like a sort of a, a tube map, but everybody has made excellent points and it is a pleasure uh, to respond to them all. So, um, firstly, Mr. Amos, Sir David, it must be recognised in this debate that free travel for under-18s is unique to London. Uh, when compared with the rest of England. This is not a debate, it should not be a debate about the merits of free travel. The government recognises the merits of free travel for the most disadvantaged under 18s. That is why it is enshrined in the 1996 Education Act and children will continue to receive it. What we are talking about here is benefits that are different in London. They are not available to people in the rest of the country, no matter how disadvantaged they may be. And therefore, it is very important to get that point on the record at the very start of this debate. Mm -hmm. People in the rest of the country, taxpayers all over the country, I will in a moment, um, in Birmingham, Manchester, in my constituency of Redditch, other places around the country where the need is just as great do not enjoy this special benefit. And they will rightly be asking, why is it London that is receiving this? I give way. Mr Andy Slaughter. Oh, so much for levelling up. Uh, and it is dispiriting, particularly in talking to a group of London MPs, to hear government ministers once again trying to divide and rule tactics and trying to set other parts of the country against London. Will the minister address the issues that, have, that come up in this debate and the serious concerns we have about our constituents? 
Minister. Uh, with respect, of course I will address the concerns. I'm about to do that. I'm highlighting the facts at the outset of the debate. So, my, uh, with, with respect, I don't think I can give way because I do want to address the substantive points, but I will be happy to discuss with members on another occasion. So, um, my honourable friend in opening the debate has highlighted the shocking extent of the Mayor of London's financial mismanagement of Transport for London. We all know, as been said, that coronavirus has cost £1.6 billion in lost fair revenue. But the Mayor of London's, Sadiq Khan's mismanagement of tra Transport for London's finances has cost £9.56 billion in the round, and we've heard many examples from members here tonight. I think we can all agree that the transport network is key in supporting a safe and sustainable recovery for London. That's why on the 31st of October the government agreed a second extraordinary funding and financing package with TfL for up to £1.7 billion on top, Sir David, of £1.6 billion funding package agreed with TfL in May which is proof of the government's commitment to supporting transport services in London while remaining fair to national taxpayers. So the funding agreement reached with TfL in May contained a series of measures to manage demand and facilitate safe travel, including the temporary suspension of free travel for under-18s. And I would like to stress that this was agreed by the government and by the Mayor of London and the Deputy Mayor for Transport this, this suspension, however, was not operationalised at the time. And no one doubts, as I said earlier, the importance of free travel. And it was always the case that children eligible for that free home to school travel would continue to receive it. Those families with low incomes, those most disadvantaged children, would continue to receive that free travel. And it is right to say, and it is correct to say, that the rationale here was demand management. As before the COVID-19 crisis, around a third of journeys were made by young people travelling to school. Or did somebody want to come in on me? Well, very, very briefly, but I have some points to make. Cyril. Thank you. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. Um, in, in my contribution, I pointed out that in normal times, in pre-pandemic times, TfL raises about 80% of its own revenue. It is not primarily subsidised by taxpayers. So it is not, sub, uh, by and large, taxpayers who are paying for free travel for uh, young Londoners, or indeed elderly Londoners. Minister. Uh, I thank the Honourable Lady for her point, but I, I will just remind her that the, the central government has agreed billions of pounds of support for transport for London. So the reason for bringing in the suspension initially or discussing it was because it was seen as necessary to ensure that there was the capacity on buses available to those who needed to use it, including some school children, given social distancing requirements. Um, and I would like to just reference here that the government is committed to supporting cycling and walking active travel. Um, people should walk and cycle wherever possible. That's why the government's made £2 billion available to do so. And we do know that the average journey, according to TfL's own statistics, uh, to school in London is less than one kilometre. Uh, so it, it is not unreasonable to suggest that some of those journeys could be done by active travel. So as part of the latest £1.7 billion worth of extraordinary funding agreed by the government and TfL on the 31st of October, national taxpayers will continue to fund free travel concessions to standard English levels and free travel to school for children who qualify under legislation. If the Mayor wishes to maintain these concessions for Londoners above the English level, he will raise the money to pay for this. And this does represent a fair position for the whole country and brings London in line with the rest of England. And in, in agreeing the recent extraordinary funding and financing package, the Mayor has proposed that he could pay for these concessions by retaining the central London congestion charge at its current level and by increasing the existing TfL element of the GLA's council tax precept. And he must make his final choice by January 2021. It is the Mayor who has decided what the level of increase for the congestion charge should be and what the coverage is. Uh, on the Hammersmith Bridge, because a number of members have raised it, uh, members will know that my noble friend in the other place is working very closely and she's leading a task force. TF, uh, TfL has been given £4 million, a further £2.3 million as well, for immediate mitigation and a lot of detailed work is going on to sort this problem out. So turning to TfL's financial situation, the government did agree a second package 
Uh, this package will provide financial support until March 2021. And the government here will make up the fair revenue which TfL has lost due to COVID-19. The deal runs until the 31st of March. The government will continue to monitor the financial health of TfL and work closely with them to ensure that they continue to operate essential services and support our recovery from the pandemic. So I would also like to put on record here that the government is not forcing the Mayor of London to raise council tax. If he does so, it will be his decision and his decision alone. Uh, the department works closely. There are constructive discussions going on. Uh, of course, uh, I would like to remind uh, the other side that the, the Mayor of London is a politician, uh, but there are nevertheless very constructive discussions going on, as we have seen by the deals that have been agreed, which does benefit Londoners and does benefit the transport network that they rely on. But it, as, as honourable members have pointed out, the finance package itself agreed recognises that the Mayor of London has not done enough to find savings himself. His financial management has not been good enough and further efficiencies must be found. And honourable members on the opposition benches have highlighted the impact of young people. Um, I must be clear, it is for the Mayor of London to explain to those young people why he has made those choices which have those devastating consequences that they are setting out. This government has stood behind Transport for London to the tune of £2.3 billion and I would suggest it is now time for the Mayor of London to take responsibility and show genuine leadership instead of seeking to lay all of his problems at the door of central government. <laughs> Elliot Colburn. Amount, uh, quite a lot of time to sum up, but your members will be happy to know I don't intend to, to drag, uh, drag this out. Um, can I uh, begin by thanking all honourable and right honourable members for coming and taking part in this petitions committee debate this afternoon. Uh, petitions, I think, are proving to be a very effective form of people getting in touch and getting involved with the issues that matter most to them. We, I've led a couple of petitions committee debates now, and I think there is an excellent opportunity for us to put our constituents' concerns on the record. So thank you to everyone for turning out uh, to support the petitioners this afternoon. Uh, can, I also thank, uh, the, uh, can I also thank the petitioners for giving us the opportunity, as the member for Hornsey and Wickerman said, to discuss something about London. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem that we get an opportunity to do that very often, uh, and it's a rare opportunity for London MPs to get together to discuss issues in the capital, so I'm grateful for the petitioners for giving us that opportunity this afternoon. Um, we've heard uh, the impact that scrapping under 18 concessions would have on people in our capital city and the effect it would have on some of the most vulnerable in our various communities. So we hope going forward that the Mayor can, uh, can show the leadership that we need from him to put that game playing aside that he does do, that the Minister has outlined so well, and indeed my Honourable Friend, the Member for Orpington, has outlined uh, in his speech, to come forward to, the government, come forward to the government with sensible suggestions by the 11th of January, so that when we have, another, uh, when we have the further discussions in March, we're not back here with the same complaints. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 331 453 relating to funding for transport for London. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Order, order. Colleagues, just before you go, I do apologise. The room is too cold, miserable. We're still trying to deal with it. And if you wouldn't mind just wiping down the microphones, we've, we've been asked to remind you. Thank you. The proceeding has ended.